Okay. So, uh, there we go. I'm in with two accounts. Give me a moment here. All right. We're good. You should be able to, I should be able to run things from here. We should okay. You can do that. I'm going to sign out of this one then. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye everybody. I'll see you in a minute. Hey everybody. It took us a little bit of time, uh, but we actually managed to get there. Uh, so uh, I need to figure out which screen is which. There we go. We got slides. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, the JavaScript and Ruby meetup. Woo! We are all here. I see people in the chat. I see people in the audience. It's amazing. It's incredible. Uh, it's actually happening. Um, it's happening.gif. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, the only other thing, uh, Mark, that I'll have you do is start recording if that's a thing. I think it is, uh, but it might be a thing we have to do afterwards. It's been a little bit since I've been on Remo. So sorry, I'm a little bit rusty, but uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, my name is Ian Felchuk. Uh, I am a local Edmonton uh, developer. Uh, I am now more on the management side of things and I am pleased to welcome you to the JavaScript and Ruby meetup for February. If you are unaware, uh, we do Ruby and JavaScript stuff every month on the first Thursday of every month, which means that the next one is coming up. Uh, and I have a bit of an introduction, and then we have two really amazing talks uh, given by Mark, the person that you saw here earlier as we tried to figure things out, and also Andy. Uh, Mark and Andy are mainstays of the community and have helped organize in the past and uh, mm -hmm. present and have been really amazing. All right, let's get into things. Just a quick agenda for us. Um, which I am not seeing reflected on the share. I am only seeing that slide. One second. OK, I hope I don't have to do this for every single slide, because that would be very awkward. Uh, so we have an agenda here. First of all, it's code of conduct. And then we have some news. And then we will have some talks. And then we'll have some time at the end for people to socialize at the tables in Remo, because uh, this is, at its heart, also a networking event letting people make connections together, uh, which is really great. Uh, so I'm going to advance a slide and hope it advances on, oh, no. Oh, this is bad. <laughs> Something is up with my uh, uh, account. So I will reshare here. There it is. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, so by attending, you agreed to our code of conduct. This is going to look really professional when this goes up on YouTube and you see me sharing and unsharing the screen like this in, a, in a just a fantastic way. So uh, this event uh, is put on uh, by people from the Dev Edmonton Society. Uh, we are sort of loosely or closely affiliated with them, but we follow the code of conduct, which you can go to uh, devedmonton.com slash, I believe, conduct. Uh, someone will put the link in chat for our code of conduct, but basically uh, we want these meetups to be a welcoming place. So please make sure that you are uh, um, kind and uh, um, considerate of other people who maybe are here for the first time or maybe don't know as much as you. This is a place for all of us to get together, uh, share our knowledge, and kind of advance ourselves uh, uh, all together. Yeah, there we go. Uh, code underscore of contact. Yeah. So it was posted in the chat by Startup Edmonton, which is great. I believe that is Mark. Um, but uh, by attending this event, you agree to basically follow uh, the code of conduct, uh, which is kind of be kind, be patient, be awesome. Um, when we were in person, we used to have these little tiny yellow icons, which would say uh, that you wanted to talk to somebody, especially if they were new. So uh, it's really important that we are welcoming. So if someone is here for the first time um, and wants you know, to talk to somebody or wants to ask a stupid question, I would love it in the chat if people would just post in the chat that they're happy to answer some stupid questions um, from some new people because uh, we want it to be welcoming. I, I know that personally, I am happy to answer any questions. Um, and uh, uh, that anyone has, no matter how stupid they are on JavaScript or Ruby, I have office hours on my Twitter account um, that you can find any reason for to talk for anything. Um, so if you're looking for an approachable face, uh, I don't mind being approachable. Uh, the next thing that I should mention, so I will ghetto share my screen again here is that uh, you will be on YouTube, actually. Uh, we are recording this event, and we'll be uploading the talks to YouTube so that they are uh, uh, available to the wider audience that we serve. Um, so if you have questions, your name might be read on YouTube. Um, so uh, you know, always be nice. Uh, and then we have some news to share. Uh, 
this is painful for me every time I have to reallow uh, uh, sharing. <laughs> uh, so as far as Ruby, uh, we have some movement in a really interesting web technology called WebAssembly. Uh, the WASI WebAssembly proposal to merge in some WebAssembly stuff into Ruby is now in the proposal stage, which is really interesting. Um, that a lot of people think is going to be the future of kind of web browsing and web development. And so having WebAssembly there in Ruby, is a, you know, powerful tools for everyone. Um, to 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 work with. Uh, there's also a really great Ruby talk um, for um, coming from RubyConf, talking about the various different versions of compiling Ruby code. Um, I found that to be a really great interest to me as I'm writing more Ruby code than I have in the past. And so it was a really great way to understand all the different history of the Ruby compiler. Uh, and we had, of course, Ruby 3.1 released. It released on Christmas Day. I'm not sure if that news got into last month's meetup, but I decided to include it here. Include it here. As far as JavaScript goes, I think the big news is actually the number two, that Angular JS is now no longer supported by Google. Um, they are forcing you to use Angular now, so they've kind of deprecated their older version. Um, there was also uh, a, a good coalition of uh, JavaScript news, the JavaScript Rising Stars 2021, all the projects and really interesting things that have come out in the last year. Um, that's a really interesting collection to look at as well. I would check that out. Uh, Deno uh, version 1.18 released. Uh, we've had some talks on Deno in the past. You should check out. Uh, YouTube for those talks. Uh, it's a really interesting uh, JavaScript runtime. Uh, and of course, we have a new version of TypeScript. Uh, it wouldn't be a JavaScript meetup if I didn't talk to you about TypeScript and how you should be using it if you aren't, because it is the future of the internet and uh, you are already using it in most of your NPM packages if you didn't realize otherwise. That is my dog who is loudly scratching her collar behind me. So apologies for that. I'm glad my kids aren't down here yet. So, uh, all right. Another thing to go over, you can see a nice picture of my dog in the background, uh, is Dev Edmonton. I mentioned that briefly, but uh, Dev Edmonton is the is an association for Edmonton developers. Um, it has about 2,000 accounts or so on the Slack. Um, not that many active ones, of course, um, but uh, we have uh, a great collection of developers from a variety of different companies all across Edmonton. Um, if you didn't know, Edmonton is actually a hotbed of development uh, of all kinds, whether it's um, artificial intelligence with something like uh, Alta ML or Amy, or whether that's uh, um, uh, more business oriented with something like Intuit, uh, but also exciting things like uh, Bioware, of course, making games and uh, companies that are kind of on the rocket ship right now, like Jobber, um, that are really exploding in terms of popularity and, and, and success. Um, Dev Edmonton is just a, uh, a loose conglomeration of developers to hopefully advance the cause of all developers across the city. So they help host meetups like this one, we are using um, people and um, uh, technologies and accounts sourced from Dev Edmonton. Uh, it's also a great place to answer questions and meet people and network and do all those things. Um, the question of the day for today was showing pictures of uh, people's internet setups and stuff, their computers and things. So um, check it out. It's a, it's a fun thread and a fun, uh, you can see what other people's workstations look like. Uh, spoilers, developers really like large monitors. Um, that was mainly my takeaway from it. A surprising number of vertical monitors as well, which I am not currently engaged in, but have, has always really interested me. Uh, all right, I mentioned the next meetup. Uh, and the next meetup is actually on March 3rd, uh, 2022. So roughly a month from now. As I said, they happen on the first Thursday of every month. So they're at least predictable. Um, we're going to try and do a better job next month about getting the word out, making sure that we advertise this properly on Twitter, or on LinkedIn, and on other platforms, just to make sure that we're reaching the, the maximum audience we can. Uh, and of course, there is always a need for talks. Uh, the reason why people come to these is not for the uh, horribly awkward person hosting them, uh, but rather for the really interesting content that we can provide. Um, and so we're always in the look for talks, especially really interesting things um, around Ruby and JavaScript. Um, they don't have to be advanced topics either. We have some pretty interesting stuff for tonight. We've done things on uh, WebAssembly before, on things on 3JS and like in-browser stuff, all sorts of different talks, uh, lots of talks about how to maintain a Ruby application as well. That's been a really great source of information for us because Ruby is now becoming this big platform that's hosting a large percentage of the internet at this point. Um, and understanding and dealing with those code bases is, is become a, a bigger issue for a lot of us. But I also like to encourage people who have more basic talks. If you want to take a look at a library or present a project that you did, um, get in touch either by going to uh, exchangejs.com slash talks 
There is a Ruby part of this as well that I'm sure someone will drop in the chat. I will drop it in later once we're in the talks phase if, if we haven't gotten to it by that point. But uh, if you're interested, um, you can also just reach out and you do the meetup-javascript or the meetup-ruby channels on Dev Edmonton, and someone will find you. We're, we're desperate for talks every month. And so if you show the, the barest hint of an inclination towards doing a talk, we will definitely be on you uh, 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 and making sure that we can, we can help you get that done. Um, and it's a great place to also get your name out. Uh, if you are a new developer, um, it's a great way to get some eyes from some people here who are a little bit more veteran, uh, maybe advertise yourself as well. Uh, as your talk. Uh, okay. Uh, there's one last thing to go on. Uh, yeah, you can also uh, DM uh, Andy, uh, myself, or Abram uh, on Slack, and we will definitely. It's a great way to to, to find us there. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, ask them in the remote chat. Um, I'll be in the chat helping out speakers. I'll be kind of popping in and out. Um, depending on uh, how relevant the questions are. So if they're intensely relevant to the action that's being done right now, I'll pop in, probably interrupt the speaker and say, hey, we've got a question from the audience. Otherwise, I'll be collating them for the end and making sure that we get all the questions answered. Um, we're going to be presenting some really interesting things today. Um, and we want to make sure that, that we have the chance for everybody to kind of ask the questions that might come up. All right. That being said, we have our first speaker. So I would like to call the stage. Uh, Mark, uh, with an introduction on uh, React Hook Forms, which if you've never had to do web development, oh my gosh, there is so many forms uh, after a certain point. Once it's not just presentational, it becomes um, uh, real important to do uh, any sort of form kind of stuff. So uh, Mark, if you can hear me, I am summoning you beneath me. Not sure if he's here. He might have. There we ah, go. I had to turn my camera go. and mic on. Can you hear yeah. slash see me now? I can hear slash see you. Excellent. I will stop sharing uh, right. and uh, you can share and take it, take it away. Okay. So I will tell everyone that I've got my screen split into three areas here. So I've got the chat up on the left. I've got some reference notes on the left and I've got my talk on the right. So I will be kind of referring back to the chat too. Um, but yeah, Ian, please, uh, if there is a question, hop in and uh, I'm okay to be interrupted. I'll just, uh, when I see your face pop up, I'll know there's a question. Um, yeah, and beyond that, this is gonna be mostly uh, some live coding. Uh, I have rehearsed this, but expect a few flubs as we go. If you see anything wrong, feel free to scream out at me. Um, but yeah, I'm looking forward to this. So here goes, I'm gonna share my window. Okay, so first question, can everybody see that? If you can't uh, leave a message in chat, then I will resize. So this is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. It is called React Hook Form. Um, it's one of many solutions for handling forms in React, but it's one I've used for probably three or four projects now, uh, and I have come to really appreciate. It's small, it's relatively simple as much as it can be, and it's very performant, which is nice. It makes a few kind of design choices that make it much easier to control the rendering and how other components um, interact with your form and render, which can, for large forms and large applications, have a real impact on performance. And the one other thing too, is that it's very unopinionated. There's no styling um, or anything like that attached to it. And you can either use just bare HTML inputs, or if you're using things like Material UI or React Select, it will actually integrate with those. And there's been a lot of thought put in to how it can do that uh, with a fairly simple API. So I don't know if we'll make it quite as far as integrating with those. We're going to see. I have a list of what we're going to do, but uh, I'm going to set a 20 minute timer here and let's see how far we make it. And we'll go from there. Okay. So. This is the code we're going to be looking at today. If that's too hard to read, uh, let me know. I can make it a little bit bigger here. Uh, but we've got a couple of goals that we're going to try to work through. The very first one, uh, stage zero, we've already done. So check right off the bat. Um, it's to set up a form. So anyone who's done React before will be familiar with this. Uh, we have a render function uh, for our app, and it just returns the markup that we're going to use for our form. I've also dropped in some styling that makes it look all nice and pretty on the side here. So you can see right now, um, there's not much to it. It's three fields. It's a string for the name. Uh, we're using a number input for the age. And then we have a drop down with a very important question, which is better tacos or burritos. We'll be answering that as today's talk progresses. 
if I hit submit right now, you don't see much of anything. It does the default form behavior, which just essentially reloads the page. And that's it. So not very useful. So that brings us to our first goal. We're going to handle form submissions. To do this, um, we're going to first pull in React hook form. So let's see in a moment. Um, so I've already kind of cheated, I guess, and added it to my dependencies. But normally, you'd want to use Yarn or NPM to install it. So from there, we pulled in the most important part, um, which goes and lets us stop our handler. So register. I'm going to get a few things. Use form. Okay. Let's over here. I was going to check the notes. Make sure I'm doing this right. Okay, so we've got two things. We've got register and we've got handle submit. These are both provided by the hook. And what we're gonna do is tie them into our form. So in here, all we do is go and use a standard on submit. And for the handler, we're gonna use the one provided the React hook form here. So, and it's actually a function which takes in another function. So handle submit will go and do all of the kind of arm waving and leg work that needs to be done by React hook form to do all the things that'll do like validation and error handling, things like that. And, and then it'll go and call whatever function you pass in here. So for now, we're just gonna write a simple function. It's just gonna come in, it accepts data. And, oh, sorry. Data. And to keep it simple, we're just going to log it to the console. Okay, so why is it adding handle submit? One moment. Comments. Oh, because I can't smell. Handle submit. That looks better. Okay, so if we save that, um, my code is reformatted there, but I'll reload this just to make sure it's fresh. And now if we come in here, we hit submit, we see in our console, we've got some data, but it's not very useful, right? You would assume that it would go and print out perhaps the values that were passed into the form, but it doesn't do that by default. So what we need to do is to get it to pull the data out of the form, we actually need to go and register each input. And so that's what this is for. So to start us off here, just to explain a little bit what this looks like, I'm actually going to do something that you wouldn't ever normally do. And what I'm going to do is go like this, Let's say register. And we'll call the register function here just so you can see what it returns. So in this case, why don't we register our name? And so you can see whenever it renders, it's calling that register function. And what that register function returns is an object with four properties, name, on change, on blur, and ref. We're not going to worry about those too much right now. But what you should do is remember that when we go and register our input, those are actually going to be mapped into it. So I'll show you what that means here. So we're going to take this register, come down to our input here. And we're going to use a little bit of React magic. So this is a spread operator. What it does is it takes the output of our register there. So those four, the object with the four values, and then it's going to pass those in as properties to this input. So this input now has a ref, a name, an on change, and an on blur. Those are all coming from um, React hook form and reporting because that's how we handle changes to the form input. So if we save this and refresh one more time, all those errors should be gone. And now if I say, I may have to remove that second register. One second. Yeah, there we go. So we can see that we actually got data back. So that is the basics of it. All you're doing is handling a form submission and registering your inputs. So I'm going to come in here and register the other two. Bear with me. 
This one is age. Okay. Down here, we need to do the same thing for our select. Okay, now if we come back in, if I hit submit on its own, you can see everything's empty. It is. I'm not going to use my rage. And let's pick some tacos. Okay, so you can see now when I hit submit, my handle submit function gets called, and all we're doing is logging that data to the console. But you could go and use that start, you know, a request to another part of the application, kick off uh, an action in your reducer, whatever you're going to do to manage your state. Okay, so. That's another thing off our list. We're now handling form submission. Let's get another check. Okay, I'm gonna pick up the pace here. About 10 more minutes. I'd like to get through as much of this as we can. Any questions before I move on? Okay, so we've got a form. How do we add validation? It's actually pretty simple. Basically, when we call this register function, it's got a second parameter, and you can pass in all sorts of different validations that you want it to do. So the most common one is required. And if we go simply doing that, we'll set it to true. There we go. Now we've indicated that that is true. If I try to submit, let's see, I'll put in some values here. So those are both full. And if I submit, oh, Nothing's happening. The reason for that is because this is failing validation. So out of the box, we don't see anything happens other than the form submission is canceled. So if I put in a value here now, then it, you can see it works again. So we've got some basic validation. There's lots of other things you can use. So for example, down here, let's assume this is a adult only sandwich site. So you need to be at least 18 to enjoy a delicious taco. So if I submit this again, and we'll see that worked. If I change this now and say you're a five-year-old, sorry, no tacos for you. Okay, um, you can also use it for selects and things like that. So here, I'm gonna indicate that it's also required. You must choose a sandwich. And finally, if I save that, save, and there we go. Okay, so we can see that's working. And if I take this off, yeah, it's not. So that's it. We've added input validation. It's that simple, it's that fast. You can pass in. Um, a validation function here or validations as an array of functions and they will receive whatever value depending on whether they return true or false um, they will go and set um, or, or not set an error and i see that we have a question um, could we use it to make sure that no one selects the select option yes that's a good question so in here in my select i actually have set values for them so here, the select one, the value is just an empty string, and it interprets that as false or undefined. So if I set it to select, run it, you can see that that validation fails. As soon as I set it to something with a value here, so like tacos or burritos, it will work. Good question, though. Thank you. OK, let's keep moving here. So we're handling form submission. We're handling validations. now. It's not very useful to have validations if you don't actually indicate what the error is if you don't use them. So the, of course, there's another way to do this. In here, we've got something called form state. Form state contains a lot of information, but one of the things it has is set of errors. And errors are actually pretty cool. I'm going to print these out just so that you can see them quickly, and then we'll actually see how to use them. So let's reload this. So I've got an empty form. If I hit it, you can see in here, it's complaining about two things. It's complaining about name 
and it's complaining about best food. And so each one of these uh, it indicates the type of validation that failed. If there's a custom message, you would set that there, and then it gives you a reference back to the input to the form field in case you wanted to work with that in your in your error. Um, and this also points out that I'm actually missing one because we want them to have to specify an age as well as a minimum. Let's say that required or an age is important too. Now, if we submit this again, there you go. We can see that we're also getting a validation check for age. So if you're following along, I think you might have an idea of how we're going to use this. It's actually pretty simple. All we do is come down here and say errors. Uh, so this is name. We're going to use that operator whose name I always forget. We're going to say required. And here, let me just make sure I've got that syntax right. Yeah, then we say something like name is required. Okay, so in here, I'll submit it one more time. And now you see, ta-da, we've got a horribly unstyled and clearly done by a developer error message. Um, but the cool thing is you could also, you, know, you can do it inline here, but you could also do up here, errors dot um, map, map through them to show a list of errors if you wanted to. It's actually a weird syntax, but you get the idea. You can put errors at the top of your form for people that like all the errors at the top and errors in line for people that like them by the form fields. So just as a quick exercise, we'll add error checking here. And this one is a little different. So we would do age and check that the type is required. That's what we did before, but we also have a second validation for it. So we need to check that one. So age is required. Cut and paste. Change it now to min and say no sandwiches for you. Tacos are sandwiches, right? Let's go with that. Here, if I fill in my name, you can see that it updates as soon as you touch the field. So in here, if I put in 43, we're all good. If I put in four, no sandwiches for you. Same down here. There we go. So our form is submitting again. Uh, I'm going to quickly put in the required check down here. And you can see how this name that we registered is the same name that we need to use for the key. Okay, so I've got five minutes left on my demo. Um, I'll quickly pause here for seconds. Thank you. That's called the optional chaining operator. Thanks, Ian. I knew there was a name for it. Okay. So moving on, the other thing that I want to show is default values. And these are particularly interesting, not just because they're kind of a, a good thing to consider and have in your form, but because we're using TypeScript, they actually um, will be used for an inferred type for your form parameters. So you can pass in a type if you want, but you don't need to if you're setting default params. Default values, so in here, I want to drop these in. So we've got name, we'll do a blank string, age, let's say one, because not. and then for um, best food. What does this that look like? Uh, save that and reload here. You can see that our age is 21 now. And you can see our name and our sandwich pick are both blank. So but the cool thing is if I come down here and let's say I'm going to register this now and I start to type it in, you'll see. Let me pick up my types one second. Your demo problem. Yeah, okay, so you can see it recognizes that type as being name, age, or best food. 
and matches there. And if I put in something like bad value, it will actually complain because that is not one of the defaults that I set. So it's a good way to kind of put those in and make sure that you are actually um, using the right names for forms because it'll pick up the type there. A good example of why TypeScript is cool and how you can do some really cool stuff with type inference. Okay, so default values. Um, I'm gonna put a check here. There is one more thing I'll mention. Down here, when you register, you can also pass in a default value there. Um, and I, if I remember this correctly, you would think that that would take precedent, but it's actually the defaults up here that take precedent. So I, in all my apps, have just been setting it up at the top there. It's a nice, simple place because the team knows to look for it there too. Okay, so moving on, getting into some interesting stuff. We're gonna ditch this because we don't care about errors anymore. But we do want to start thinking about rendering and watching values. So they have uh, a function that you're going to get here from your use form called watch. And watch is useful because it basically gives you a way to subscribe to values. And so you can do it naively like this and just say watch, and it will watch everything. Oh. Fresh. All right, so you can see it's rendering here. It's using the default values that we have. And every time I make any change at all, it's re-rendering because we are watching all of the values, which a lot of the time is not optimal, right? We're rendering that whole form again. And if there's anything expensive in there, you're going to be wasting a lot of renders and a lot of CPU. So what you can do now is say, let's take that out. And instead, watch the name. And again, you can see it's picking up our types there. Go to TypeScript. And if we log it out, you'll see something interesting here. Name. Um, so here, it's interesting. If I go and as before, type out, you can see it's watching and printing out the name there. But here, if I'm scrolling through all sorts of pages, it's no longer re-rendering, right? It's actually able to optimize and recognize that our component is not using the age when it renders. And so it doesn't re-render the component. It's a great way to optimize. And one of the big things that I think is different from this versus other forms. So you pick and tacos, doesn't mess things up either. So watch has a few different options. You can also go like this and pass in almost like a dependency array. And it works just the same here and there. If I go, it's, you can see it's printing out an array now. But if I were to add, let's say, age to it, I think the hot reloading gets messed up sometimes with registering and watching things. So maybe need to put that in. If I adjust age, that adjusts as well now, too. So very cool. We know that we can watch everything. We can watch specific values. And we can watch um, arrays of values, almost like how you do a depth. You can also do one more thing here. And so for anyone that uses use effects, learn and quick fix. I don't know. Let's see if I can do this from memory. So in here, we're going to go and I'm just trying to remember how to do this. We're going to do a callback for a watcher too. So going here, this is going to run once on mount, and we need to watch. Watch. Um, one of the tricky things is that um, watch is not guaranteed to be stable between renders. And so what that means is it's they've optimized it for performance during render, but that um, between calls to renders, the value of like the watch function 
that you receive back from use form can change. It's unstable. And so that's why you have to pass it in as a DEP here when you're defining these. That's something that can be very easy to miss. And I wish it wasn't like that, but it is. So unfortunately, you'll have to watch for that. So cons. And I'm going to refer to my notes here because this is something that I constantly type wrong because it's a big callback. So I apologize. Let me just pull out my notes on the other monitor here. So we do watch. We're going to pass in a function. And it takes a few things. It takes our value. And it also takes in the name and the type. And we can go and if I match my brackets right. We'll console log that. Yeah. I realize we're just 20 minutes here, so I'm going to wrap this up pretty quickly. And then we need to return a way to cancel. Return a function. And that subscription has an unsubscribe. So if I've done this properly, which it looks like I haven't, sorry, just at me. There we go. Missing semicolon. Um, that is an example why semicolons are sometimes important. Um, okay, so here all we're doing, we have a use effect. So the first time this is rendered, um, it comes in and sets up a subscription for a watch function, which every time a value changed, it's gonna print out values for everything. Um, you can choose which value to watch if you want. And then when this component unmounts um, or the value of watch changes, it will unsubscribe before calling the effect again. So if I refresh this and I type that all correctly, there you go. So you can see all of our values are coming across there. So that can be useful too if you have hooks and stuff like that that you want to mix in. Um, okay, so I think I'm just about done my list here. I have two more things that I can show. Actually, the sixth one I can show, the seventh one I can model through. Uh, would people maybe like to give me a thumbs up or thumbs down uh, about whether I should keep going or everyone's brain is exploding and I should stop here? Of engagement, Mark. Uh, we should probably keep going for a little bit. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm going to jump in to the next part. Um, this part is a little more advanced, so I'm going to start with a little bit of a recap um, because we're going to be using refs. And so for anyone that has not used refs before in React, they can be a little bit of an explosion, um, but they are also super useful. They are a more advanced React feature, but they're super uh, important. So let me pull this up. React, ref. Let's go straight to the references. So basically what refs do is they let you have um, a, a special value. It's called a ref. We use part of the React API called create ref. And when we do that, we create something where we have a render stable reference that you can use in callbacks, things like that um, you can use in your code. And when we go and do a render, you can go and there's a dot current value on the ref. And what it is, is it will always point to the current value of that ref from the last render. And the reason why you have to do like the dot current, it's a little weird, but um, what it boils down to is that when you do a re-render, usually these references are used to link to the actual raw DOM element that is outputted by React. So there's actually a special syntax there when you're using JSX, you can pass in um, a ref property to it along with the reference that you got from create ref and it will set dot current to a reference to that DOM node. So that's sort of what they're talking about here. Let me show you. Um, so I'll make this way bigger. I'm assuming one has magnifying glasses attached to the monitor. Um, so here they're using a class component. I'll explain why maybe later, but just ignore that. Uh, so in here, you're gonna go and call create ref. And then in your render, you're gonna pass this in ref. And what that does is that goes, and every time this renders, um, it will go and set my ref 
dot current to the value um, of this actual div in the DOM. And so that's important when dealing with forms because a lot of the time um, you're going to actually use the raw DOM input to access the value of the form at any given point in time. So I don't know if this was the best explanation of what a ref is. If you understood that, great. If not, I apologize. Um, but we're going to be using those a little bit in this code. So there's one other thing I want to show people, and that's these. So forwarding refs are a way to use um, refs with functional components. Because what you'll see is that a lot of the time, you may actually be writing code where you would, would think you want a reference to something like this fancy button, right? But unfortunately, the fancy button is uh, a function. It doesn't have an instance, right? And so you, know, you could get an instance of that function, but it wouldn't actually be an instance um, of that, the output of that function, like the render output. So you would get a reference to this, but not this on the last render. So using them with functional components is a little tricky, but what you can do is use this cool thing that they have called React Forward Ref. And what it does is it basically lets you go and say, okay, I can't get a reference to fancy button, but I can pick one of its actual DOM elements to sort of act on its behalf. And so you'll see this a lot with forms and things like that, where you have a lot of wrapper and hullabaloo going on um, around a simple form element. In this case, it's a button. And so what you do is when you define your render function, what you're actually doing is, or sorry, your function component, what you're actually doing is you, you pass it through this React forward graph. And it's going to take in the normal props that you would expect, but it also takes in a second argument for ref. And so then in here, you pass that ref into whatever object you kind of want to be act on um, behalf of this component when you render it out. And why that's important is because now if you come down here, you can use these functional components almost as if you could get a reference to them. Um, you can get references to class ones and you can't get references to function ones without doing this. And so here, when you get that ref, even though you're doing it on a fancy button, it's actually sort of delegating it to this button here. So if you were to interrogate ref.current, it would actually reference this here. So I hope that made sense because you're going to need to understand that to understand the next part of this. Um, so we're going to be looking at integrating with uh, existing components. So this is where you have a form, you have gone and maybe you know written your my cool app input that has your label where you like it and it has all your other stuff where you like it. Uh, but you want to be able to use that still with React hook form, and of course it's meant to make that easy. So. I'm going to show you how. So keep that stuff with ref in mind. I'm going to explain this a little bit as we go. Uh, OK, so we're back here. Just a refresher. So we've got our app. Uh, I can erase this stuff. I don't care about that anymore. This simple goodbye watch. Um, so down in our form here, we have a couple things. We have these kind of repeated chunks of code. Where we have labels and inputs. So we're going to go and extract one of those into a component. But to do that, we don't want a reference to the component. We're going to want to get a reference to this input because that's what we actually want to register against. So there's two ways to do that. One is to go on in your component. It can expose a property for register and then for any values that you want to pass into it. Um, so that's the first thing we're going to try. And then the second way we're going to do it is actually using that create, um, forward ref, excuse me, and show how you can use that to avoid having to pass in quite as many things. So up here, well, let's do this. So const, we're going to call it input with an I because it's a component. And let's we'll make a quick fragment here that and then we're just going to come down here and cut and paste some of our code that never goes wrong in a demo rate okay so in here we need a few things so we, first of all we can see that we need a label so label that will go right here
And then in here, we need to do a couple things. We need to pass in register with a name. So let's grab name, let's grab register. And we'll pass both those in here. We're going to take the name, pass it in here. And then we'll ignore this part for a second. I'll show you how to pass that in. And then we also need to pass in errors because without that, we can't show our error text. So we need to replace this with array access. And let's be sneaky and put our label in there. So that's not required, but welcome. Um, label. OK, so if I've done that right, we're going to be able to get errors. We're going to get name. We're going to do all that stuff. And we should be able to come down here and replace this label with our new fancy input. So first of all, let's just try this. Let's have two of them, because I'm sure that won't break anything. Label is name. Name is name. Weird, but I think it's right. Register now. This is interesting. We're going to just pass through that register function we got from our form. And errors, same thing. We're going to pass that through. So if I've done this all right, I should see two name fields. I'm just going to reload to make sure that registration is right. Okay, those look good. So let's take out our old one. And now I should see everything working as it was before. Um, oh, I have to make a sandwich. Excuse me. There we go. So you can see from the perspective of our form, everything is working the same way. The only difference is that um, now we were able to pull this into our own custom component and we can go and you know, style it, reuse it however we want. And the really important thing is that we passed in register, we passed in errors um, so that we can reuse those down here. And here, if we wanted, we could just do like args or validations. I've seen it called a couple of things, but you know, that would just go in here. Okay, so not too crazy, but we're gonna get more interesting here. Any questions about that? Okay, I'm gonna keep watching the chat. If you have one, just uh, post it there or drop it in the question field. Okay, so now I'm just thinking how I'm gonna approach this. Let's refactor that and see if we can do it using react.forward. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know why it's getting mad at me about React, but it is. My package manager's wonky. Okay, still running. I was going to ignore that error. So in here, what we're going to do is we're going to create a function and go back to the React docs here. Um, and just take a look at that syntax. So here we go. We're going to do it just like a normal one, except we're going to receive the props there and then the ref is the second parameter. So let's go back to our code. So in here, so now our props are actually just label name. And I think we need errors too. And in here, we need our ref. So yes. And uh, I've got two. Matching braces. Okay, can anyone in the chat see what I'm forgetting? Label name errors ref unexpected token semicolon. Missing uh, here. Oh, you're right. Thank you. See, there are advantages to live coding. People can spot your mistakes. 
Okay, so we're gonna cut and paste this here and then I'll show you how to do this a little differently. So it's right, those are not defined. We don't have register, we don't have required. So how do we fix this? So what we're actually gonna do here is pass math through that. And then this is still broken though, and I will show you why in just a moment. So if we come in here, do that. My code sample, I had to have on change and on blur. And I'm just trying to remember why that was. Okay, bear with me for one moment. This is one of the surprising times when it works when you don't think it should. I remember right. Okay, so in here, we're not going to pass those in now. We're going to go, and because we are using um, that reference, we can actually put register right on it here. So we go like this register. This. And oh, we do need name for that, though. Okay, so now if I try this again, I should have everything working properly. And I was playing with the age field, so that's probably why, because I actually implemented the name field. Okay, one moment. What did I do wrong here? Okay, so we're expanding this one using the ref that we gave it, passed in the name. It's not getting my values, one second. After forward ref, oh yeah, you did, okay. Um, one moment. When I actually did this this afternoon, I chose to do it to the select input, so maybe that's my problem. Let's make this simpler and see if I can figure out what's wrong. We're going to ditch this. I'm guessing it's something to do with me passing names in twice. So we'll take that out. Ref, ref. Let's ditch the name down here. Moment of truth that I get that's working. No! There's something wrong with my ref there. Register. Name and name. Forward ref, 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 ref. Okay, so I'm seeing a question, where am I passing that ref? Good question. So you can see the actual ref comes from the register thing because when it's expanded or when it's evaluated, one of the returns um, values on that object that returns is ref. So this spread operator should go and get applied here. So this ref comes from the reference set here and I'm passing then in on change and on blur input. There's something I'm missing. What is that? Name. Do we need to do this? Ha, huh, okay. So I'll have to figure out why I need that, but I needed to pass the name in there. 
Am I sure the on change has passed over? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest. I just know that all of the examples I've seen, they pass those through. And I think it's because when you do some of the other integrations, you need to be able to control um, how, like the, with validations and stuff like that, you can get them to do on change as well. So I think that's where the issue's coming in there maybe. Let me see here quickly if I erase this. Getting the name now so I can put errors back in. Bear with me. This is the thing with live coding. Who wants to follow along actually? I should have done this at the start. <laughs> But here is a link to what I'm using. And if you sign in there, you might actually see that there's worked examples of all of those things in that checklist, not just the other ones. So down here. I'll pass that through. And I'll pass through errors. Oh, we can put our error text back. Uh, Mark, I, mean, I think I'm going to have to call the last two minutes on your presentation here. If we want to get to Andy's in time, we're going to have to point, pass it over. So, okay. I will share that link um, and people can can use that, I think, to, to figure out the bits here that I've not been able to show. That works. Okay, so I will just wrap up by asking if there's any other questions or um, comments, things like that, that people have. Uh, we did have a question from Derek earlier uh, asking if it's handling any of the HTML input validation attributes. Um, so, you know what, I, I've not seen it do that, like where it goes and drops them to the attributes rather than use them. It's, it's weird because in the docs, like if you go, it specifically calls out that it's, um, where is it? Yeah, apply validation. So it specifically says that it uses the HTML standard for form validation. But if you inspect the actual elements, they're not there. Like, so if you look at this one, for example, and let me make my inspector bigger. Room. So yeah, you can see all it has is its type number and age. None of the attributes pass through. Um, so I'm not really sure why they choose to do that. I assume maybe it's because the behaviors aren't consistent enough across browsers. Um, but yes, they do try to make those validations at least align with what is in the spec. And I mean, maybe that's hoping that one day they will be able to use those. But good question. Um, and it does also, like, one thing I will point out is that the docs and stuff like that are great. Uh, I had them up there for a second, but, you know, they have worked examples uh, for all sorts of different things. Um, the other cool thing is that it works well with React Native. So, you know, you, you probably saw there that a lot of the forms and things like that aren't actually using uh, any kind of special, you know, markup other than the form elements themselves. And um, it's very easily able to integrate with other kind of third-party libraries. And so that also applies when you're using React Native. Um, you can see that here, you know, that you're pulling in the different kind of, not DOM objects, but you're pulling in the different components. But the actual way that you use the form and stuff like that is very similar. The big difference is that they're using these things called controllers uh, that take in a render. And so for anyone that's used kind of render props in the past, Render is basically a function that it's going to pass in here. It passes in like on change, on blur, the current value and stuff like that. And then you would use that with whatever component you're using in React Native to render. And that's actually exactly the same thing that you use if you're working with third party form things like React Select or Material UI inputs. You use a controller as well uh, with a render thing to do that. So yeah, good question. Um, I don't know. I've been very happy with it. I haven't run into problems. It seems fast. It's small. And it seems like there's lots of people using it. So there's lots of sources to get help. So I would definitely recommend if you are struggling with forms in React, check out React Code Form. It is a good place to go. Perfect.
Amazing. That sounds like a, a really good end to your talk there, Mark. Uh, there's some Perfect. passion for maybe a part two of that. So maybe we have to connect on that because uh, it's a really powerful library and forms are like the classical issue in React and having such a good solution for it is something that you know we need to publicize a little bit more. For sure. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we have some slides. Mark, I'm going to need you to unshare your screen. <laughs> it will disappear in a second. Boom. There we go. Cool. All right. Next up, we have Andy. Uh, Andy is going to be giving us a, uh, a demo into something called Superbase, which if you haven't, if you looked at Firebase and like, why couldn't this not be Google? Um, I think that Andy is going to have some really good news for you. So I will, again, summon him beneath me uh, as he will probably put down what he was working on and try and find the the, the camera and microphone buttons here uh, as he uh, is. Oh, he's not a speaker. Oh, gosh. Uh, I will get Mark to invite Andy uh, as a speaker because I'm guessing that is the reason why he hasn't appeared yet. Uh, okay, give me a moment here. I'm gonna have to switch accounts again. One second. Yeah, yeah, we'll do it live. <laughs> That's a timely Fox News reference um, for those of you that uh... <laughs> it's a joke, basically just for me. Uh... Oh, all right, Andy. Oh, that's Andrew. We need. There we go. Wait, sorry uh, about that. I think I got it right this time. Uh, Andrew, Andy, there you go. Want, uh, if you want to impromptu give a presentation, that would be great, but you're going to have to fight Andy S for it. So I think we'll leave it to Andy to do this. All right. Hello. There we've got the share going good. And uh, let me just switch it over to the presentation. Okay. So, oh. I've got an echo, unfortunately. Um, Mark, could you, um, that may be me. Sorry. Hear an echo, Andy. Um, here if... There, how's, how's that? Okay. Um, I, I'm. Uh, I came across this uh, via a tweet that appeared, and somebody did a quick presentation, um, specifically using it in a mobile app. And I was uh, very interested in it. And and so when we were looking for speakers last month, I thought, well, I'll step forward and I'll uh, I'll bring this forward because it might be of interest to some of the people in the group here. So, um, I, I said, I said a Firebase replacement. Um, I kind of changed that as I dove into it. I, how about a Firebase alternative? So th that's that's where I figured I'm going to go with. So first off, a little bit about me. Um, developer, architect, technical consultant since I graduated college in 86. Um, a lot of my work is actually done internationally on healthcare data exchange standards. So um, I... I work for organizations all around the world. Uh, I do have one contract in Canada right now, but I also have contracts in the US and I've had it in many other countries. Uh, so I've been an independent uh, private consulting firm. I've had my own firm since uh, 1995. Um, and my main interests are, I use Ruby a lot for utilities. I don't do so much Ruby for web apps anymore. Um, and I, I also work with Swift on iOS for mobile, and that's kind of what brought me into Superbase. Uh, I wanted to get, take a look and see about how it would tie in, and I also thought it would tie in more for the communities uh, that, that are here. So Superbase, it, a Firebase alternative, it, it's more or less than that as well, which you, you know, I'll get into. Um, Firebase is a standard offering from Google that allows kind of a, a database as a service, shall we put it that way, with a, a number of other things for doing storage and, and so forth like that. I have never used Firebase. I've heard about it quite a bit. Uh, it's common in the mobile space. Um, a lot of people use it, of course. Um, it's used for all sorts of different things. Um, people have tied into it. Um, 
and and it's been quite popular. It's also been one of the ones that has sort of outlasted. There was a number of other ones that were out there that have gone by the by, and people have been it's been subsumed into Firebase. So the first question is why? Why do we need an alternative? Well, as as Ian said, it's not Google, <laughs> which for some people is important. Uh, the one of the aspects is, is, of course, if you're using Firebase, your information is being stored on Google's servers and you're using Google's libraries. And for many people, that's that's not something that they want to do with the stuff that they're working on. Um, another reason for using it, however, which was very appealing for me, is it's um, PostgreSQL or Postgres or however you want to pronounce it. Uh, based. So I've been using Postgres for my own stuff since uh, I think it was either 97 or 98 um, when I first bought a Linux uh, um, workstation and, and installed Postgres and started playing around with it. Uh, personally, I have a long association with relational databases going all the way back to my first job in 1986 when I played around with uh, Vax RDB. Um, so I've liked Postgres A because it's free and B because it does everything I've ever needed from a database. Um, you can you can suggest that maybe it's not as powerful as some of the commercial databases and I'm, I'm not gonna argue with you or whatnot, but in many situations it runs just fine and it does run a lot, number of large installations. Now, another thing about Superbase is it does have a free tier for hobby and experimentation. I think that something similar exists with Firebase, but uh, I'm not exactly sure where it comes in or where it kicks in. One of the things that I particularly liked about uh, Superbase is that it does have a Docker container where they say you can install this on your own. So they have a service that you can, like any other platform as a service kind of idea where, where you can come in and, and, and um, sign up and do things with it. But for those that are familiar with installing their own um, server software and so forth, you can set it up on your own and they do have a Docker container. So you can actually run it on your own um, and be completely independent of them. So that's also another nice point about it. So when and where are you going to use this? Well, if you need a simple centralized persistence layer across everything, you're, you're developing apps, you know, you might have multi-platform apps. So you're, you're, you've got some stuff that you're developing for Android, some stuff that you're developing for iOS. Both of those are native. You've also got a web thing, you know, which you're doing using React and, and so forth. And you need a common back end. So something that all of them can access and set up. And this is a, a you know one of those situations where that works. Um, often what I'm talking about here is you have an independent front end. So you have an, a front end that sort of sits independent of what's going back on in that, that back end persistence layer. Uh, for the Rails people who are um, in this, that's a little bit different than the architecture that you're used to because the the Rails you know, Rails app tends to mix some of the front end unless you're developing a pure API. So one of the things that this does is you're pushed a little bit back from the concept of the Rails API, but you you know the Rails API is often not all that far off. Uh, your database objects, your your plain old Ruby objects, which are you know models on the database entities. So this does give you some mechanisms. Uh, I mean, it's it's not going to give you the query capabilities that Active Record and stuff like that builds in, but you, you know there it is. Another good reason for when you're going to use it is when you need something that's self-hosted, where you simply don't want it running on Google stuff for whatever reason, it's internal or whatnot. You, you know. And so this provides something that you can control on your servers, install it with the Docker container, and you're you're good to go. So I, I scraped this from their site. Um, 
it, here's the architecture of of what they have the simple diagram they've got some good documentation on there i would highly recommend that you go to their site superbase.com and take a look at things so they off offer a number of services beyond just um a restful interface to databases uh so you've got the real-time updates you've got some storage mechanisms you've got some authentication pieces which are really nice and it's all tied together into a suite of services they comment that they're they're um probably competitive with firebase i don't know that they are Firebase is a, a well-developed, long-time commercial product that many people use. So, I mean, they're, you know, you're, you're going to have something that's um, s still they're bringing up to speed. But, but it does look fairly robust. Um, whether or not it's ready for prime time, if you're going to put, you know, you know you're not going to convert your million user application that's deployed right now on Firebase over to Superbase, I would suggest. But if you're building something new, this might be a place that you look at starting. So here's the architecture, just a quick slide to go over it. Um, what you'll do is is the, the, the approach that you're gonna take is you're gonna have a client that's uh, hitting that back end. Um, it's, to me, it's a little very similar to traditional client server this kind of stuff that ran in the um, mid to late 90s um, and thankfully is long gone, but with better technologies. Uh, so they have clients that you're running in a number of languages. They, they are JavaScript focused. Uh, I, I will say that right out of the box. So the support for JavaScript that you're going to see in the documentation, everything is superb uh, to my view. Um, you know, maybe the people of the ones of you that are well versed in the JavaScript space will say, "Well, that's just a common thing that we do in JavaScript." But from the things that I've saw seen in their documentation, um, which we'll get to in a bit, it was like, "Whoa, that was surprising." Uh, they do have a C sharp client. They've got a Dart client for intended for Flutter applications, which is really interesting. Uh, Flutter is a cross um, platform framework that's built on top of Dart. Um, often used in mobile. Uh, the Go Kotlin ones are a little bit behind. Same with Rust. Um, I would like to see those come forward. They don't seem to be very far in Java. Uh, I do know it looks like they're working hard on, on getting Kotlin up to par with the other ones. So th that's, that's impressive. So that's going to bring that in on, on the Android mobile side. Uh, they got Python clients, um, a Ruby client, which I didn't actually look into. But the one that interested me, of course, was the the Swift client, which from what I saw is um, quite good and seems to be reasonable. And so if you were looking at a mobile app that perhaps you had uh, Kotlin identified for Android at some point in the future, this is definitely um, something that you want to take a look at. So... After you sign up for an account, the first thing you'll do is you'll create a project. Uh, this is the project screen. I didn't follow through with this one, but you, you, you know, you give a name to the project. Um, you set up a password. Uh, I, I've been choosing the Canadian server. So this is running their leasing services from AWS. Uh, so they're providing free. Uh, and when you cross their boundaries, and I have a slide showing some of the pricing. Um, when you cross their boundaries, uh, they will give you a notice and then you can bump it up to a paid tier. Um, their boundaries seem to be reasonable, but the jump is quite a bit. Um, if you're used to using something like Heroku, uh, the database sizes are far larger here for the free tier than they are in Heroku. So th they call it a hobby tier. So. So after I set up my, my first project and everything like this, they give you this nice little dashboard, um, which lets you see what's coming in so that you can monitor your usage and so forth like that. Uh, see how much it is, see if you're getting close to those things, which is handy because I don't know that Heroku actually has something similar to give you a warning. You see down the right side, this is kind of the, the screen that they use for doing it. 
is um, there's a number of things. There's a, a, a SQL editor. There's a um, authentication. Uh, there's some storage stuff. There's some reports. There's some um, some database uh, utilities. Uh, then there's some log features. Uh, there's also, um, you can take a look at logs so you can manage what's going on with the servers and have a sense of how it's performing and so forth like that. So it seems to be fairly reasonable and, and, and quite well. I haven't used the extended utilities and so forth, but it, like I said, it, it, it seems to be something that they've got a real product. So if you did move into their commercial tiers, I think that you would be happy with it, although you don't necessarily need to. So I'm just going to touch on the main pieces that they have on their board. Um, they do have screens for doing table creation. They've got a SQL editor so that you can, you can actually store SQL scripts up there and then run them. So if you have queries and things like that, they've got DB tracking with reports. They've got an overview feature, which tells you how much is in there. And you can look at the tables and so forth like that. Um, they do also have some advanced features that you can load into. This is one of the nice things about Postgres. Postgres has been around for a long time and is a very capable database. Among the things that it has is it has extensions for GIS and all sorts of things. And as a matter of fact, it's one of the standard databases in use if you're doing any GIS kind of work. Um, you can also, there's, there's, there's functions, you can create stored procedures. You can actually create stored procedures using JavaScript, which may be of interest to many of the people here, so that you're not forced into um, the Oracle-like uh, PL SQL language that's uh, the traditional stored procedure language. However, if you're familiar with that, uh, you know, there's actually a, a, a pure Oracle kind of version for doing stored procedures in that. Uh, there, I have seen there's a Ruby version for doing stored procedures. I think there's a Java one. It, so it, it's really quite amazing how much. Uh, Postgres, of course, comes with full text search built in, and it's quite good. Uh, you can access the stored procedures from the interface and so forth. So you have a lot of capability built into how you do things and, and so creating it. Now, the table editor is fairly rudimentary if you're used to fancier tools. Um, one tool that springs to mind is is a tool called Toad, which most DBAs use for, for doing their, their professional uh, SQL database, relational database creation. Uh, I haven't seen it in a few years, so I don't know how fancy fancy it is. I've always just coded up um, data definition language, DDL, right in a text editor and I, I source control those and that's what I use for my table stuff and I go from there. So, uh, you know, to me, their table editor was, um, got in, in my way. Uh, so I just edit the scripts and then run them in because I like to do them, but you, you know, it's there if, if that's, that's how you want to do it. Now, the next piece that they have is uh, they have got, got this whole module set up for doing authentication. And, and I didn't explore it very far. Um, I hadn't gotten quite that far yet. I, I'm still at the level of dealing with the database and pushing things in. There's some things that I wanted to exercise on my own for some um, personal projects. Well, personal for my company projects that I'm looking where Supabase, I think, is a solution that I will use. Um, so I haven't gotten to this, but I did notice a large number of things that, that I found very interesting. Uh, first of all, it you have access to things like role-level security, um, Postgres policies, uh, all layered in there. So you can define these things using the Postgres stuff. And I don't know a lot about Postgres policies. Uh, but it's, you, you know, if you have a, a multi-tenant, um, like, um, databases where you've got multiple people using a single database based on their users and so forth like that, you can segregate it so that everyone's data is secure from other people and so forth. Everyone is happy um, with a single database and, and that works quite well. So, you know, some wonderful features for doing that. They've got a whole sort of email based um, templating facility built in so you can create the templates to do the sign up confirmations, password resets. 
if you want magic links, if you want user invites, you can set these things so that th they can be triggered and then they'll go out and then people will have the full process of logging in. And they've also got third party uh, access as well. And this is not the complete list, but I just wanted to give you an idea. Uh, Apple, Azure, Discord, Facebook, Boo, uh, GitHub, Google, Notion, Slack, Twitter, Twitch, Zoom. I, I mean, these are all existing partners that they're working with where, and they have like, for instance, I, I looked into the, the Apple documentation for doing the sign on with Apple and they give a very well done. Uh, I didn't follow it, so I can't validate that it was absolutely correct, but you know, it, it was, it was detailed. Right. It spoke about all the things that you had to do with setting things up with Apple in your developer account and so forth. It was not, uh, you know, download this and set this and then you're done. It, it was quite, um, quite well put together in terms of documentation on what's essentially an open source project. So uh, I, I was quite pleased and I'm looking forward to this because I, I think that some of this stuff, uh, you know, beyond just the, the access to the database, the authentication pieces uh, have some real capabilities that that I'm hoping to build on with some of my stuff as well. So uh, I, I was really interested in this and, and you know, particularly the aspect that if I can tie it together with the, the security features built into like iOS, that would be even better for me for for building some things. Now, <laughs> one bullet on this slide, <laughs> the storage capabilities, you can store stuff. Um, Right, the, their system right now is set up. I think it's it's uh, S three, but it handles all the security stuff so that things are managed properly. I don't know if you ever manually tried to set up S three storage and so forth. It can be a bit of a pain. But so they've got you know that baked into their overall product. So it, it, it it's a, it's another aspect that when you get to this, I think you, you know it would save you a fair bit of time even when you're looking at their paid accounts and so forth. So with that, I'm, I've just got a couple of quick slides dealing with what some of the client stuff does. And the, the point that I want to bring out here is the code that you're going to see, I actually copied from the website for my uh, test bed project that I've been using. So they actually generate code. I actually had to go in and edit out my URL because <laughs> they give you in JavaScript, you know, so if you're not using JavaScript, I'm sorry, but they actually, they literally give you in JavaScript the code that you need. And here we're setting up the client right now. Of course, the, the, the key is buried and I don't have that either and so forth. And they talk about what you need to set it up and how you establish the the API keys and so forth like that. And they generate a unique URL that you access to hit even for like your, your hobby databases and so forth. And so here's how you, you create a, a using their libraries in JavaScript. And then here's, you know, a query. And I want to reiterate again, this is copied from their website. So I've loaded in a table. I have a table called fiscal years. This is generated on their website that they gave me like I, I could just go to their website and I hit the copy button and I can paste into my code. And this is what I'm talking about. The documentation It's like, whoa, this is <laughs> this is well done. Um, and, you know, it's very I, I'm not aware of how clean the syntax is from the JavaScript space. Uh, I know from the Swift space, I. It's it's comfortable to use, and I was looking at that. Uh, it's not active record uh, for the Ruby people, but you're you're a little bit closer to the database than you are with active record, which can be a good thing and not a good thing depending on how you view it. Um, but you, you know, from my standpoint, it's really easy enough. And these are some simple examples. They actually gave the complete set of complex examples. So they have examples on how to retrieve individual columns. They have examples and they actually have the columns from the table. This is what I mean, right? So they, they had, um, as a matter of fact, I will skip over to it. 
uh, if I can. Safari, over to my other window, here we go. And I think it's right, yeah, right here. It's a little small, I realize. Um, let me make it bigger, right? So you can see I just, they, you know, read foreign tables with pagination. The copy button is how I got the examples in. So this is in there. So here's a listing of the tables that I've loaded in that I've defined. And then they've got all the, you know, I want to select the, the year column from the fiscal years, or I want to select the year start or the year end. Um, I have a series of flags on the fiscal years, prorations, closed, adjusted, all that sort of stuff. Um, and there it all is. It's, it's just there, you, you know, they've, they've created and then it's like copy this in and you're, you're good to go. Um, so I was, I was quite impressed with um, that aspect of it. Trying to move through here so that we get through this quickly. So um, I didn't see if we had any questions. Ian, I hope you'll interrupt if there is anything. So some general inf um, observations that I have on it so far from my use of it is, you know, it removes or limits the work that you need if you had to administer your own PG server. Um, specifically in my case, uh, with some of my, uh, my personal firm that I use for um, managing stuff, I, ha I have some created some databases for my firm that I use. Uh, and I was looking at perhaps pushing them out onto AWS and just accessing Postgres through that rather than what I'm doing right now. So I've, you know, I've got a Rails app that I'm running internally and so forth like that. Um, this is this is where Superbase really got my interest up because it looked like it was a lot easier than either converting my Rails app so that it was like an API or either just pushing up my Postgres stuff right onto AWS. So this was sort of like the halfway point between the two of those with a lot less work. Um, it It's very easy to access from the command line. And as a matter of fact, um, one of the things that I had done is um, I defined a variable on my command line which is the URL for it. So just using PSQL, which is a standard Postgres command line interface for doing SQL, you, you know, for those of you that still type SQL. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mentioned the fiscal years table, right? So there's the fiscal years table and I'm, I'm attached to that database, you know, and I can do anything from the command line here just using PSQL. So for me, that was a big bonus. Uh, when, when I work on Rails apps, I normally have three terminal windows open. Uh, one of them is uh, for running the app in, in server mode. One of them is for just accessing the app through console mode. And the third one is uh, PSQL, PSQL running against the actual database that I'm doing so I can do raw SQL lookups with things. And, and this allows me to do all of that sort of stuff. So I was really quite, um, I didn't realize it would be quite as easy as that and would fit in with my workflow, which was really nice. And that also means that things like doing data imports and exports, and I have a whole series of Ruby utilities set for doing that. Essentially, all of that still runs because you can run it through PSQL. So they also have a CLI for doing local development and sort of a migrations thing where you can develop the database and then push it up to like to do a differences. I didn't look at that very much. Uh, it looked interesting, but uh, from if you're coming from Rails and you're used to the migrations, that might be something that you look at if you want, want to go down that route. Now. To me, another thing is, is it's good if you're handy with uh, SQL and, and DDL. So I, I, I've, like I said, I've been using Postgres since 97, 98. And when I first started using it, I mean, I was, you know, building all my own DDL for defining tables and everything like that. I had gone over 
um, uh, drank the Kool-Aid, as you will, and went to using uh, migrations within Rails for a lot of the stuff that I was working on. And now I'm looking at pulling that back out if I pull these things out of Rails applications and just convert it into using uh, Superbase. So, uh, you know, you, you do have access to the SQL dump if you, if you want, but uh, I, I was looking at structuring them in ways that would be handy for me. And, and so I'm, I'm looking at that. Now, you do have the table editor, but if you're, you know, if you've got 40, 50 different tables in your database, uh, I I don't think that the table editor is the way that you want to do it. <laughs> now, you know, because of how you can do things, and, and one of the things I was looking at was running my, my SQL definition scripts from PSQL on the command line, uh, which actually works quite well. I, you're, you know, you're just doing normal source control, and then you've got a build step somehow that you deploy against the database. So, you know, that's that's fine. So if, if you... If you're comfortable with SQL and you're comfortable with doing the DDL, it's it's got something for you. If you're not, you, you know, you may have some issues with it. So, you know, because you're defining the database. And if you're used to active record and how, you know, active record migrations work from the, from the Rails side, and that's all that you've done, then, you know, getting used to actually typing in all the SQL can be... Um, uh, it's a it can be a challenge at first, so just something to be aware of. Now, I did want to put up the pricing, so I thought that the jump from the free tier to the pro tier was a little steep. So it goes from zero to twenty five dollars a project a month. I, for myself, I would have to evaluate if my databases were large enough, and that's one of the tests that I was doing, because you're allowed to have 500 meg in the, you know, your hobby databases, which is a pretty good size. Like I said, it's way bigger than Heroku. Heroku had a, a 10,000 rows maximum or something like this before you got into having to go with the paid stuff, uh, which a, a number of, like some of my databases would have crossed already. So that's one of the reasons why I never looked at you know, doing Heroku, going into a parade, a paid Heroku app, you, you know, there was other things that I was looking at, you, you know, would it be better to go with a AWS route or things like that? At $25 a month uh, per project, uh, you know, depending on how large my thing was, uh, you, you know, if you're doing something at scale, then that's that's not going to be a big cost. Um, and it may take you a while if you're building something to get to that point. So, I mean, it does look like, so on, on the database side, it's uh, 500 meg. Um, on the storage side, it's a gig. So, you know, you can have up to a gig of um, images and whatnot, documents, whatever that you're storing, and you're not paying anything, right? So there's, there's that. There's a certain amount of communications as well, which you're blocked at. So, you know, if they had something in between the free and the pro, uh, I would seriously consider it. Now, you may not get the same sort of performance, but if you're okay with installing things on your own, I mean, you might, uh, and this is where I'm coming from, is if I'm too large for the free, I may take a look and see how much effort it would take to, you know, download uh, one of the Docker images and put it up on the Linode because I could be maybe running a Linode at $5 a month with the Docker image and it's doing everything that I need it to do. And, um, you know, that's, that's certainly a price that I, I could, um, I could swallow for something like that. Cause I was looking at that, that sort of a Linode thing anyways. Right. And so the super adding super base on top is no additional fee. And I can use the free tier for doing, you know, any sort of development testing or whatnot that I need. I just have to make sure that I'm using small databases and things like that. So I, you know, there's, there's still some things to be done where I don't have to manage multiple instances. I could use their instance for doing my development and test uh, configurations. And then my production, I can move over onto a, a, a Linode that I manage, which would save the profi, right? So at any rate, um, like I said, this is a high level overview uh, based on the time and so forth. Uh, I didn't feel that 
you know, I could get too deep into it. I didn't want to um, spend too much time, you know, typing in tables because typing in tables is not going to interest anybody. Um, but having said that, you know, uh, any questions or anything? Uh, we had some questions that I believe were answered earlier on. Um, Andrew Eisenhower asked a question about authentication, uh, which Mark Bennett ha uh, helpfully answered in the uh, chat. Uh, and Song Minute uh, asked a question about NoSQL versus SQL, but that's kind of, I think we'll answer that in the tables afterwards. That's kind of unrelated to Superbase itself. Um, but I think that's it for now. Anybody have any questions that they want to chime in in the chat with before we go to the last part of our presentation tonight? So uh, there was a question about uh, authentication and, and two factor. They seem to have something involving SMS. So, you know, as I said, I hadn't gotten into it, but it looks like it's fairly robust. And, you know, it may not be Firebase standard robust, but it, it, it's a good start. Let me put it that way. <laughs> Uh, Mark Bennett asks about GraphQL. Is there any support for GraphQL with Superbase? Uh, they're working on it. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a that's I think a high high end will be delivered soon sort of thing that they have identified on their site. So th they had a, a number of technologies that they said you know these are our key points. Uh, the the Kotlin one was identified as being uh, we want to get this up and going soon. Um, GraphQL was another one. So they, they had about three or four um, uh, on the libraries and interfaces thing that was that was identified. Yeah, uh, Mark says that it's coming, but they're doing it from scratch inside Postgres. Wow, doing it in the DAL layer seems crazy, but uh, like that, that seems pretty intense. Uh, actually, I don't know that it is because I mean, if you think about it, you're doing it closer to the database, right? I guess, yeah, like you're mirroring database context, right? Like the whole yeah. idea of GraphQL is translating entities into like, I don't know, serve your own like swagger style APIs. And so if you're right at the database layer, then you have better access to like, what are the fundamental entities of the database? That's really mm -hmm. interesting. Uh, Mark linked the, uh, uh, the architecture so we're going to take the next uh 35 minutes and go over the architecture in depth uh andy take it away uh, <laughs> yeah no <laughs> uh thank you andy uh for the talk very interesting um i'm not against google at all but it's nice to see that there is some competition for such like a an integral product to a lot of mobile applications with like firebase so it's really good to see that there are um, some varieties out there yeah I, I don't think you need to be anti-google to understand the like, like i said i mean sometimes so you saw my stuff with health i mean and i don't know if 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 uh firebase is hipaa certified because you you can run things uh, actually don't uh, it, it's a serious thing and they will do that so like so for instance azure supplied databases are hipaa certified yeah uh, hipaa being a big thing in the us so you're not allowed to store any health data on something that's not hipaa certified so azure i know is hipaa certified um because I've met people from Microsoft that are working on it to be, you know, it's a big thing. Uh, AWS has HIPAA certified zones that you can do. It's a big thing with them. I don't know about Firebase. I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Um, but if it's not, uh, then, you know, you have a self-hosting option, which you can use, right, for this. Uh, ironically, that's the last question that's popped up here from Mark is, have you tried the self-hosting on Superbase? Yeah. Not as yet. Uh, as I said, I was going to see what their limits looked like in terms of the things that I was doing before I I, I dug, you, you know, I, I haven't done Docker images before on, on Linux. And so I'd have to set up in Linode and then, you know, download the Docker, you know, so that was... I may get there, Mark. <laughs> I, think, uh, I think all of us are in this position because we don't want to maintain servers. Um, like, yeah. That's, that's why the cloud is a thing. Yeah, yeah, right. It, it, you know, so I mean, Linux is the next step up from, well, I sort of maintain a server, but I don't really, right? <laughs> yeah. Or Linode is, sorry. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, thank you, Andy. Uh, I think we'll transition into the last part of our presentation here to just try and give 10 or 20 minutes to people to, to, to um, socialize the tables a little bit if people want that. So I'm going to bring up my slides. And I've changed some things, and hopefully uh, I've messed with my permissions enough that I can... Aha! Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, that's so much worse. Wow. <laughs> there is something wrong with the shares that I have. All right. Well, thank you uh, to our presenters. Uh, something is definitely wrong with Firefox. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the Dev Edmonton Society really quickly. So uh, if you're interested in the events that we host uh, in all the society in general, or if you just want to get kind of a little bit more familiar with what uh, DES is and what they do, uh, you can check out the hashtag Dev Edmonton Society channel on Slack for uh, any of the uh, stuff that we're doing at the moment. Um, with meetups being mostly online, there isn't that much infrastructure or things we have to do, but there's still some business that we're doing. Um, I know there's a few initiatives we're trying to launch, so a few new meetups and things, and there's always like opportunities to give back to the community. Um, there is a meeting every month on the second Wednesday of every month. So coming up, that would be this coming Wednesday, the 9th of February at 8 p.m. Uh, you can find links and notes and stuff of how to attend that. Uh, or just poke around the Dev Society channel and someone will get back to you. Uh, next up, oh gosh, this is just, the formatting on this is all sorts of awful today. That's what I think uh, uh, um, Google heard the things that I was saying about them as they're punishing me for using Firefox. Uh, so uh, one of the other things that uh, these meetups were great for is just advertising jobs and things. Uh, so, uh, are you looking for, uh, if you're looking to, to, to hire, I would encourage you to put uh, your links in the chat. I know that uh, Jobber is always looking to hire engineers. We're on a big hiring push right now to try and hire uh, a bunch of L2 and senior engineers, even some in the principal and staff areas as well. So if you're still there, I know you can head out to, to Jobber and uh, uh, getjobber.com and check out the careers page there. Uh, anyone who represents a company uh, want to share some jobs pages in chat? I'll call them out as I see them uh, for anybody else. I am not seeing anything. This is me saying words so that people have time to find their company's website and possibly put their careers page into the chat. So I'm going to continue to say words for approximately the next 10 seconds. This is called vamping, by the way. It's an essential skill if you start hosting events, the ability to say nothing while saying an awful lot of things and making time and space for other people. Uh, I think I've made uh, enough space, uh, so I will move on to the next slide where I believe we will be thanking our sponsors. Uh, so the first sponsor uh, is a company that's near and dear to my heart, uh, Punch Card. Um, they are a software consultancy in Edmonton. Uh, they do software consulting, uh, all sorts of app development, uh, JavaScript apps, mobile apps, web apps. They do SharePoint and document portals. Uh, orchestration through teams and things, all sorts of different document governance type stuff. But the majority of their work is in the mobile and web uh, spaces. Uh, I used to work there. I'm still very happy with uh, the, the company in general. If you want any, uh, if you want to talk to me about that, I can put you in touch with the right people at Punchcard. Um, they are a fantastic place to work. Uh, next up is uh, Jobber. Uh, Jobber is a Edmonton success story. They do uh, um, small business software, basically uh, making um, small kind of mom and pop shops in the kind of service industry. So think of, about things like snow removal, um, cutting lawns, doing HVAC, those kind of places where a lot of smaller companies exist, giving them the software to compete with like big, large companies um, because it's really hard to, to run your entire business off of paper doing things like... Um, uh, invoicing and coding and all that stuff. And so they provide software to do that. Um, and uh, they've just got a huge round of funding as well. So really interesting success story. Uh, next up is uh, Iron Sights. Uh, Iron Sights is a fantastic company that does uh, mostly kind of oil field service technology type stuff. So a lot of business oriented software. Um, also based out of Edmonton, also big in the DES scene. They've sponsored meetups in the past. Uh, they were a longtime sponsor of the JavaScript meetup, um, and uh, they do some really interesting work, uh, really interesting from a more kind of smaller startup kind of perspective. Uh, oh, gosh, I should learn not to hit that button. I don't know what is up with my computer. Uh, so next up is Startup Edmonton. Um, they are a valuable service for Edmonton. 
Uh, they provide a lot of really great services to companies. Um, they help incubate um, smaller startups. Um, they have lots of classes and things, lots of resources available, and they provide the software that we use uh, and the accounts that we use to, to host events like this. They're invaluable partners. Um, they're currently moving. Um, I would check out Startup Edmonton's website, which I believe is now called Innovate Edmonton. Um, they've moved under, I believe, a new kind of uh, structure to help different stages of startups, not only just the, the guy in the basement, but also the guy looking for like Series C funding and stuff like that. So um, really interesting company um, and really interesting and really valuable for Edmonton as well. Yeah, they are, they are definitely moving to a new building, um, which is uh, um, a great point. Um, they are currently doing surveys and things to try and figure out, hey, what does this look like? How can we help? Um, and it's great to, to engage with them. Uh, and then, oh, hey, it works if I change it from a different way. Uh, if you want to sponsor us, this is not as important lately, but sponsors uh, help us pay for costs and things. Um, this is more of a problem when we're in meat space um, and can you know shake each other's hand and do all that sort of stuff and eat pizza together. Um, but uh, sponsors are still really important. Uh, if you wanted to sponsor right now, I would encourage you maybe to reach out um, in an organizing capacity. We could always use more help um, getting talks, um, advertising things, just kind of helping out in that regard. Um, so get in touch with one of the organizers, which would be uh, myself, uh, Andy, uh, or Abram, who I believe are all in the chat currently. Uh, hey, hey, look, if I share the individual thing and not the screen, it actually works. Goodness gracious. Uh, so as I said again, our next meetup is going to be March 3rd. That would be the first Thursday of every month. So in roughly 31 days, uh, we will be seeing each other again um, for uh, the March meetup, which I am excited for. If you want to talk at that meetup, please reach out because we're still always looking for chat for, for talks. All right, that is all I've got. Uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. Um, and in a couple of seconds, um, we are going to, and I'm going to need uh, uh, Mark Bennett to, to cue this up. So he should probably start opening up his secondary window because we'll need to stop the presentation at some point. We'll go all back to the tables. Um, I would encourage you all to uh, share. Um, and uh, um, not share, but uh, um, try and go to a